Every 10 seconds for the past 20 years, Gary White and his co-founder Matt Damon have helped someone on Earth with access to water or sanitation. What's even more incredible is that the 66 million persons whose lives changed over the past 630 million seconds actually took ownership of their destiny as the $5.5 billion that enabled them to get household water and toilet solutions were not gifted to them, they were loaned. 90% of those borrowers are women, taking an average loan size of $370. $77, and while these people are arguably some of the poorest humans on earth, they pay back their loans at a 98% rate, demonstrating once more and, if needed, the tremendous value there is in having access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Now, this is me. And if I look so ecstatic right now, it's because I'm about to sit down with a living water legend, Gary White himself. Why a legend? Well, because the water credit initiative he kicked off back in 2003 was unheard of in water and divorce, and 20 years later, it still raises an eyebrow when you're telling people that corporates can invest their top-line revenue in generating some of the most impressive human development advancements while legitimately expecting financial returns. All of this because... Water creates immense value for people. It's clear. People coming out of poverty are willing and able to pay for that. And this matters because it enables to create a lever effect. When I started in this business, every dollar that went into water and sanitation through philanthropy went in and was spent and was gone. Now we're seeing us able to bring philanthropy in and cycle it over and over again. If you look at that journey, if you look at that value that's created by water for people, if you look at that philanthropy getting multiplied over and over again. If you look at having the financial network in place that can find those projects to invest in and have a connection to the capital markets, capital markets are theoretically infinite, right? There's just so much inertia in all the machinery that's in there. It's calcified, it's stuck, it's rusty, it moves at a slow pace. But that's how capitalism works. If you create value for somebody and you have capital, they're going to find each other. Someone just needs to create what Gary calls the financial plumbing and initialize the pump. And the reason why I'm putting just between quotation marks is that that task is not easy and requires tremendous water entrepreneurship skills, hence the title of this episode which I stole from Tom Ferguson, as you'll hear in a minute. You're listening to Don't Waste Water. Everyone in the world who woke up today got water somewhere. It's just a question of how much they were paying for that. And in terms of their time, in terms of their health, in terms of their girl's future with their education, in terms of, of money, hard capital cost. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to this special episode of the Don't Waste Water podcast. We're still stuck in the water sector as thinking about how it used to be decades ago, when really now there are billions of people who could participate, who've lifted themselves out of poverty. And when you come out of poverty, what that's one of the first things you want. You want water. <laughs> you don't want to be spending all your money and all your time to get water. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and my guest today, as you'll have understood by now, is Gary White. If you're just waiting for all the capital to come from the top down and supply everybody with water basically for free, it's never going to happen. And if you want to have people have the opportunity to find the solutions that they want from the bottom up, that's going to be limited by the solutions that are in the market place or that are there with utilities. And this is where we're at with our next evolution with water equity and water and climate resilient infrastructure. Gary is the co-founder of Water.org, Water Equity and Water Connect. And today you'll learn what unique strategies Gary White uses in his water endeavors, how a charity outperforms corporations and governments in providing clean water, what challenges Gary faced in doing so, what and whom inspired him, some of his key successes and achievements, but also how you can help and what lessons any water entrepreneur can learn from Gary's approach. A special thank you to the Bluetech team that enabled this episode we recorded at the recent Bluetech forum. An even more special thank you to Holly, Lily, Aoife and Paul. And the last word before we start, if you like this episode, please share it with a colleague, a friend, your boss or your team, and I'll meet you on the other side. You did an amazing job. I do a lot of these and rarely is anyone so well prepared. Hi, Gary. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Antoine. Great to be here. I've been waiting for the day for now. 
at least two years since I read your book, The Worth of Water. Mm. But I want to go straight into it. We had this update mm. of the World Bank looking at what's missing mm. in terms of money so that the world gets access to water. At the time of your book, it was $116 billion a year more that had to be invested. Mm -hmm. Now it's updated to $140 billion per year just because we didn't take action. So of mm -hmm. course, 2030 is coming closer and mm -hmm. we're not meeting the goal. What's missing is 0.2 percent of the world's GDP, but still the world doesn't put that money in water. Hmm. Why? Hmm. Well, you should like to start off with the easy question, that's <laughs> I see. So it's complex. There's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, there's competition for those same dollars across other sectors, other infrastructure. And a lot of that is, is much more visible. You know, you see public transit, you see roads, highways, uh, bridges, you see telecom, and it seems to be much more visible to people than kind of like the pipes that are in the ground and the sewers that are in the ground. And so it takes some pretty significant events like you see, you know, in Cape Town or Sao Paulo or now Mexico City in order for the attention to get focused on water. And sanitation is even harder. Also, as we look at low and middle income countries where we're focused on with water.org and, and water equity is the sense that there's not bankable projects there, that there aren't investments that are ready to go. And a lot of that's true. It is a big need in terms of water and sanitation facilities to have more skilled training, to have better business practices, to be more ready for investment. And so that holds a lot of the capital back as well. That's what we're, we're focusing on, trying to close that, that financing gap. Just to be sure I understand that one, that means that we look at the bottleneck and we think it's the money because the money is missing. But mm -hmm. even yeah. if more money was available, mm -hmm. it would not be deployed because the bottleneck is somewhere down the vertical. It's like an onion, right? <laughs> to quote Shrek. Olgers are like onions. There's layers to this. You got to peel them back. The kind of proximate cause seems to be lack of financing, but why isn't the financing there? Because you don't have the financial returns. You don't have the risk reward profile that's correct. And so that's kind of where we're starting to attack the problem now. As we look at kind of top-down finance, I think, you know, you saw in the book, what we've really focused on a lot is bottom-up finance, helping women living in poverty get access to small loans so that they can get the water and sanitation solutions that are best for them. Oftentimes, that is needing about a two or $300 loan to pay for a connection fee to a utility so that they can get water on a regular basis at a much cheaper rate than buying it from water vendors, sometimes 15 times more per liter buying it from a vendor than getting it from the pipe. Well, the question then comes up like, you know, we've helped 66 million people create this demand from the bottom up by getting access to small loans for water and sanitation. But what happens if the pipes aren't there to connect to? And that's where the top-down investing needs to happen. And so we see this need to kind of complete the equation as this demand is generated from the bottom up. And it's generated because this is generating tremendous value for people. That's why they want access to water. It increases their livelihoods. It lets girls go to school. It lets people be healthier and kind of gets rid of all of these coping costs that they experience. But what if when they want to connect to the utility, the water grid isn't there? And that's where we're starting to focus now more with water equity with our Water and Climate Resilience Fund. That's the fifth fund that, that we have launched at, at Water Equity so that we can work on investing in that infrastructure and find the bankable deals that are going to provide the financial returns that our investors are looking for. There's a lot of deconstruction yes. that you just shared. <laughs> you mentioned coping costs. I think to me that was the most marking statistic in the book. Mm -hmm. You're showing that, I'm going to just mm -hmm. steal your words, that yeah. it's expensive to be poor yes. and that it's $300 billion a year that the world is paying because mm -hmm. some people don't have access to water. So yeah. it is a pure cash positive move to give mm. access to people to water. I still we don't do it. I'll go back to the number of people you've helped. Mm -hmm. But if I got the statistic right from your presentation, 75% of the people you've helped are in rural areas. Yes. To which infrastructure do you connect in these mm. places? Mm -hmm. Because mostly it's not existing. So you have this kind of yeah. chicken and egg. Where do you start? It is kind of a spectrum, right? So you think what's defined as rural in India, for instance, and oftentimes there are scattered houses around kind of a center, you know, a Chayat, they call it. In those situations, there is this ability to have a centralized water storage tank with a pump to then have a distribution network that covers those areas. But beyond that, you get to a certain point, you're 
right, that they're so rural that you're not going to have a centralized network. And that's where kind of the beauty of the water credit program comes in, because our financial partners around the world are lending for whatever solutions households think are best for them. So in very rural areas, you see people using rainwater harvesting, for instance. So they can take out a loan for a tank and guttering so that they can capture water from their their roofs. They can take out a loan for a small pump and sink a well. There's some low cost ways to do boreholes and hand dug wells. I was just in Indonesia uh, last week and I saw you know several people who were taking out loans so that they could make their hand dug wells deeper because of drought there, these wells are starting to go dry. And so people will take out a loan to dig a deeper well, to line it, to make it more serviceable for them over time. It's incredible how resourceful and innovative people are are in these conditions because they need water, right? They have to have water every day or else they're not going to survive. And the question is, how do you kind of break down the barriers for them between what they need and and water? And that's what we're trying to do by saying, look, here's some capital. You guys know what you want. You know that you want a hand dug well here and you need a loan for that. Or this person over here wants a rainwater harvesting system. Or this one, you know, wants a little bigger loan and they're going to put in an electric pump to get water and build a tank. And maybe they're going to also then use that water to create a business. I met women in India who once they had water, they started making these cinder blocks out of kind of the local materials that they had there. So they had started a business because of that. So I think we fail to imagine how much value is created for people by water and how they can turn that into a means of production to boost their household income. And this is why these loans get repaid at a rate of 98%. That's the decisive thing, which is you are loaning money to some of the poorest people on earth, more or less without background credit check, Mm. and they repay you at a 98% rate. So that means it is simply profitable to get access to water, which is a difficult message to bring across. Yes. Mm. You have not started that Mm. way. Mm. You have a history of being part of the water decade, of having been doing like NGO more of a traditional fashion before you did that pivot, which got you to get qualified by Tom Ferguson when Mm. he was on that microphone as probably the best water entrepreneur. Mm. How do you get that shift? What Mm. nudges you to go to water credit and say, that is the right approach. Yeah. I'm not a finance guy by training. I have three engineering degrees, right? So to me, the benefit in the engineering degrees is that you're taught how to think. You're taught to find the problem, diagnose the problem, and then kind of match the solution to the problem. To me, that is what drove me, that that mindset when we started an NGO that was about drilling wells and basically raising philanthropy, drilling a well, giving the project away and moving on. And then you, you look at that solution and you compare it to the problem, right? And it's pretty quick to emerge that there's no way that there's going to be enough charity in the world ever to solve that problem. And so you're left with this conundrum, like, what do you do? Do you bury your head in the sand and keep doing more well drilling? Or do you like try to innovate your way out of it? And I was fortunate at the same time to be getting insights from poor women around the world. You know, I was traveling the world, sitting with women in their communities, visiting them in their households, just trying to understand how did they cope with their water poverty. And they all cope, right? Because today, everyone in the world who woke up today got water somewhere. It's just a question of how much they were paying for that. And in terms of their time, in terms of their health, in terms of their girl's future with their education, in terms of of money, hard capital cost. I did my, my research for my graduate thesis in Honduras, and I saw people there who were paying 25% of their income to purchase water from vendors. So you get these insights that women are already paying for water and that there's not going to be enough charity in the world to do this. But then how do you nudge this financial system, this financial infrastructure towards the poor? And that's where we don't make these loans. We've never made a loan ourselves. What we've done is gone out and nudged the system, nudge those who are already doing microfinance, those institutions that already have a banking relationship with some of the poorest people. And we said to them, look, there is a product here. Now you're loaning for sewing machines, you know, and a woman sews clothes and she has cash flow by the end of the week. You're loaning for a cow. We have cash flow by the end of the week selling the milk. And what they didn't understand is like how this could be a loan product that would actually be a business or generate money 
for them. So they didn't trust that this would be a loan product that would work. And what we did, we used our philanthropic capital to say, look, we'll de-risk this for you. We'll provide some guarantees. We'll help you do the market research. We'll help you understand that there is a product here. And once we broke through that barrier and these microfinance institutions, MFIs, saw that there was a loan product there, that's when we understood that like there is the potential to tap the capital markets in a way that could be beyond on philanthropy. Again, using philanthropy as a catalyst to set in motion the market correcting work that needed to be done so that now 66 million people have availed themselves of these loans through our partner network of 140 financial institutions around the world. Again, this gets back to one more theme, and that is partnership. It's like, we were not going to go out and start a bank in every country (laughs) that we're working in. It's like, how do we get those right partnerships in place so that can happen at the local level? And that was then completing the picture of the journey from like drilling wells and start to finally match the magnitude of the solution to the magnitude of the problem with the capital markets. I have two questions on the 66 million. The first is simply a big number question. Mm -hmm. If we look at what countries do, what different institutions do, what different places do, Mm -hmm. I would tend to believe that Mm -hmm. as a single organization, the fact Mm -hmm. that you brought access to water to 66 million people Mm -hmm. probably puts you in the top Mm -hmm. somewhat, if not simply on the top position. Mm. How do you look at that? Mm. Is it a positive sign that you're doing incredibly well or is it quite concerning Mm. that you're a Mm. bit alone in in that bracket? I don't want to measure a by how we're doing relative to others. Everybody is pitching in, you know, all hands on deck kind of approach to this. I want to measure our success by, yes, the number of people we reach, but also how fast we're closing the gap between everyone getting water and where we are now. And to me, that is the only way to look at the problem and to challenge yourself and to innovate. We're here at the Blue Tech Forum, and there are a lot of tech solutions that are being innovated, and those are important. We need technology in this area. But despite my three engineering degrees, I've come at it from the the choke point of finance, and we need to drive more capital into this so that there is capital to invest in these aquapreneurs, these people who are out there innovating. They're starved for capital as well. What we're trying to do is to bring so much more capital into the market in a way that can invest in those types of uh, startups and entrepreneurs that can also invest in, you know, women who are making a few dollars a day and that can also work with utilities. A lot of utilities around the world in these countries where we focus are completely strapped for cash. And to your point at the outset, it's like, why isn't the capital there? Because there's so much more competing for that. So if we can work with utilities, a lot of utilities now are doing concessions where they'll allow consortium to come in and bid on a project to get the infrastructure built. Sometimes they give a concession also to run that utility for a while until then it transfers over to the utility, to the local government to be able to then own that asset. And so we're focused on that type of capital coming in as well. And that's where, you know, we've just launched our fifth fund at Water Equity, which is focused on water and climate resilient infrastructure that will be focusing on investing in that type of work with utilities, with high growth companies that are focusing on goods and services to those utilities and to the water sector. So we have twin pillars where we can invest in projects that are being developed. And then we can also invest in growth companies that have technologies. The thing about our asset manager at Water Equity versus a lot of other asset managers in the world, even those that focus on water and sanitation, ours does this through the lens of it has to be delivering impact around climate and low-income populations to make sure that they are disproportionately benefiting from these types of investments. And that's what we are going to continue to adhere to because that's why we exist in the first place is because it's people living in poverty that have the greatest needs. And that's kind of in our DNA to go after them, regardless of whether it is philanthropy or impact investing. But how do you create a category? Because you describe that very well in the book, how philanthropy money is something that exists. It's mm. money which goes out there, which is spent, and which you never see mm. coming back. Mm-hmm. Then you have investment money, which is money which you put with mm. various levels of risk, but you expect it to have a return. And mm. let's put sustainable and impact okay. investing aside for now. The main criterion is it has to make returns. Mm. 
-hmm. And you're somewhat in between. You're saying we don't have to waste that money. We can have a return. Make it work harder. Make it work harder. How do you create that category? It is challenging because, you know, most of us tend to think of things as either this or that. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of the way that the, the human mind tends to work. It's black and white. It's yes or no. And it's philanthropy or it's investing that's going to yield a market return. What's key to this is that there is immense value being created for poor women when they get access to water. Like I said, they're starting businesses. They're saving, you know, a lot of money if they're buying water from vendors. So there is value being created. And what do investors need? They need to invest in things that are going to create value or else they're not going to get repaid. And so once you kind of make it undeniable that poor people aren't a charity problem to be solved, but they actually are a market to be served, then the capital markets will start to pay attention. And I think that's what we're trying to do to bridge that gap. We're doing what I call creating the financial plumbing that allows those investors to find women who are living on a few dollars a day and kind of take the friction out of the system. When you start to have a proof point, when you have 66 million people getting access to loans, $5.5 billion in loans have now churned through our partner network and the they're repaid at a 98% rate. Then when you go out and launch an asset manager and you have that as an underlying asset, it's not easy by any means. You know, our first fund was just friends and family. You know, Matt, my co-founder, Damon, put in the first million for our first $11 million fund. And then, you know, we created a $50 million fund. And then we did a $150 million fund and another one. And so now we're on our fifth fund. And the reason that people are investing is because they see it as a way to, yes, get competitive financial returns, but also to have human impact and social impact and, you know, for businesses, ESG impact. To answer your question is it's really hard to bridge those two worlds. But now that we are successful getting the investment capital in, it actually helps us raise more philanthropic capital to scale this. So the Bezos Earth Fund has provided a $10 million philanthropic grant to us. Amazon has provided a $10 million grant. Many other you know corporates and foundations have provided that philanthropy to us to take this to the next level. Our interim goal is to reach 100 million people with another billion dollars in investment capital. And the reason we're going to be able to build that investment capital portfolio is because we have the philanthropy to go out and start this up. If you look at what we had to do to create water equity as an asset manager, it took us about $20 million to invest over the course of many years to stand that up. We had to invest that philanthropic capital early before we had a fund to hire the expertise, to put the talent in place around the world that we needed to have the investment deal flow before anyone was going to invest in us. So you see that's the catalytic power of philanthropy. We were able to raise enough unrestricted philanthropy to invest that $20 million to get water equity up and running so that that philanthropic capital could leverage the markets. And now water equity has raised nearly a half a billion dollars in committed capital that wouldn't have been there if we didn't put the $20 million in philanthropy. So that's how you get the philanthropy to work with the markets. So you're saying it's not only expensive to be poor, it's also expensive to help the poor to come out of that, exp I mean, 20 million just to create the fund. It's a commitment because you're creating, again, yeah. something which is a, a weird animal. But to my napkin calculation, because I have so many questions, mm -hmm. you mentioned the $5.5 billion of money which you've deployed. You also mentioned the 66 million people who gave access to water. Mm -hmm. I do stupid maths. 5.5 billion, which I divide by 66 million, makes mm -hmm. about $83 per person. Mm -hmm. So that's what it takes to take someone, indirectly bring them out of poverty because you give them access to water. Yeah. If you multiply that by the 2.1 billion people who don't have access to water in the world, again, I know I'm, I'm doing stupid math, no. but yeah, <laughs> just to give you a sense of, of the scale, that's $175 billion. Mm -hmm. But it's a one-off. Mm -hmm. It's not like the recurring money we need to put every year mm -hmm. to reach the same goal. Mm -hmm. And if we assume you can scale to the roof mm -hmm. and, and beyond your 98% payback mm -hmm. rate, mm -hmm. that means that money is not gone. Mm -hmm. It's money which keeps working. Yep. You just have to have that, yep. that, that capital. If I take now the, the World Bank numbers and I extrapolate them towards the goal of 2030, SDG mm. 6 is reached, the traditional way it would cost 1.7 trillion. Mm. Your way, it costs 175 billion. Mm. 
Mm. So 10 times less. I'm an engineer as yeah. well. So I'm also out of water when it comes to financials. Yeah. But you've kind of found the martingale to be 10 times mm. cheaper to reach the same goal while still having the money working. I know I'm taking a ton of mm. paper assumptions here. Yeah. But mm. what prevents you to go from 66 to 100, 200, and ultimately everybody has mm-hmm. access to water. What prevents us is like that next barrier that we're trying to remove. And yes, if you do the the numbers on it and the number of people we're reaching per dollar invested is, is really strong, but it presupposes that those people have a water grid to connect to, to have the infrastructure there. You can think of, you know, a woman showing up at a utility saying, here's my $300. I want to connect to this utility, then she gets connected. But that also presupposes that there was a utility to connect to. Mm -hmm. And so those numbers have to be aggregated in a little bit different way. But the point is, is spot on. And that is, if you're just waiting for all the capital to come from the top down and supply everybody with water basically for free, it's never going to happen. And if you want to have people have the opportunity to find the solutions that they want from the bottom up, that's going to be limited by the solutions that are in the marketplace or that are there with utilities. And this is where we're at with our next evolution with water equity and water and climate resilient infrastructure. So we know we've been very successful at creating literally millions of microloans from the bottom up. But now we need to come at it from the top down for two reasons, at least. One is that the capital is not being invested in those utilities and in the infrastructure to provide that service. Number two, when that is being invested, it isn't always being done by looking through a climate lens to understand what's the vulnerability in that infrastructure that's going to make sure that it's going to be climate resilient. What we've done is, because we realize we have to look at this from a project finance perspective, we've built, you know, 140 MFIs, financial institutions in our network. Mm -hmm. And that has been pretty straightforward to go out, especially because so many of these MFIs tell other MFIs about it. And then the word kind of spreads. So they're kind of their own marketing mechanism for us. But if you want to go and build water infrastructure in Brazil or in Kenya or South Africa or India, it takes a whole lot more than convincing one MFI to do this. So the problem largely is that people talk about there's plenty of capital available if you just have the right deals, if you have the right infrastructure play and develop the project in a way that convinces investors that it's going to be cash positive. You have a lot of utilities out there that are saying, we need investment, and you have the capital market saying it's there. But what you're missing in the middle is like the bankability of a deal, deal by deal by deal. That's where we've now, again, we've used some of that philanthropic capital to launch what we call Water Connect. So Water Connect is a separate entity that is in the business of understanding what is needed to develop a project like a water treatment plant that serves a poor neighborhood, understanding what it takes to get that deal to bankability. Sometimes that can take up to one or 2% of the project cost. If you're talking about a $100 million facility, it might take a couple of million dollars to do the study, the feasibility study, the environmental impact study, the climate resilience part of that. All of these things that need to happen that give investors confidence that this is bankable. We've used philanthropic capital to, again, go out and hire all the people around the world that we need to be credible in that space to develop projects. And so we've just launched that uh, in the last couple of months. Now what we have is philanthropic capital coming in to help sustain that initiative until it gets profitable of Water Connect. And then we have Water Equity over here ready to invest. So what we're able to do is to provide all of this under one roof. So when we are using Water Connect to go and develop the project, we know what it's going to take to get Water Equity to invest. We have the checklist, if you will, of the investment committee at Water Equity as Water Connect goes out and builds a bankable deal so that we have a high probability that the investment will come. That's the key to this because this has been disaggregated so much with technical assistance funds and some blended finance facility over here that's doing the technical assistance and then the 
you have the investors over here and they're not really coordinated. So it can take years for this to happen. And so what we want to do is compress that. And by putting this coordination under one roof and having kind of a single point of management for that, we're able to kind of make the deals flow faster so that the infrastructure gets built and so people can connect. Some numbers which I think go to your point, the typical project we're discussing here, if it's done in a PPP and developed mm-hmm. by a private partner, mm-hmm. it's going to take 7 to 15 years to go to market. And when you speak with us private partners, they say, if only mm-hmm. we had a better link to the utility, a better link to mm-hmm. the DFIs, we could take that down to one to two years because mm-hmm. all the rest is just the efficiencies of the systems. If we involve to the DFIs in the process and we are doing now from the beginning, instead of seven years to develop a project, probably you can develop two years, three years. If you reduce the time and the money to develop a project, it will be more attractive to bring any other players. Because nowadays, if you say that we are now closing a very big project, 1.5 billion, six years of working, if you can bring seven years ago partners and you explain that this is my project, nobody, nobody, believe me, join forces with you. But if DFIs are in this position to serve this risk and to accelerate the process, for sure, they will facilitate for any future projects the process for new players. What you're saying is that by having all of those under the same roof, well, you're getting rid of the inefficiencies and hence you can be faster to action. Yeah, that's exactly our theory of what we're, we're trying to do. We hear a big demand for that in the marketplace. The Development Finance Corporation in the US is one of our investors in the previous funds and they're looking to come into the infrastructure fund as well. We see that compression and that under one roof approach as being attractive. Now to my challenging question on that. I fully understand why you have to go out and do water credit and why nobody else does it. Mm-hmm. Because you have to prove a point, you have to mm-hmm. start a thesis. Mm-hmm. Of course, you yeah. show that it works, but still, mm-hmm. it's pretty special. We discussed about water equity, how that is a weird animal where you have to create a category. And mm-hmm. there as well, it's successful, mm-hmm. it works, but someone needs to start it and that's you. Mm-hmm. Water Connect, mm-hmm. though, there are project developers out there in the fields mm-hmm. whose job and livelihood is to do that. So mm-hmm. what's the gap in the market which Mm. you're filling with that? Is it because the existing ones don't want to go in the geographies where you're at? Mm. Is it because they don't want to take this kind of project? Or is Mm. it simply because of what we said Mm. of bringing everything under the same roof? By and large, the the project development that's happening is happening in the industrialized countries, more affluent countries. And it's not as complex, possibly, as trying to do it in a low-income country Mm. that doesn't have a strong track record of sustainable utilities that are there providing these services. That's one thing. What we are doing that I don't believe any other project development company is doing is coming at this with the lens of low-income populations to really make it part of our investment thesis, to make it part of our impact metrics that we are adhering to for our investors. Part of those metrics aren't just the financial returns, but they're like, what's the demographic of the population that's going to benefit from this? What's the climate impact uh, that's going to result from this? So we believe we are unique in the market market in terms of having this different lens that looks at the human side of this, the socioeconomic indicators of of the population we're serving, the adaptation value of a project that we're bringing in to make sure that that completes the circle, right? Nobody wants to be investing in a project where the source water wasn't carefully studied to understand what's happening with climate change in that watershed Mm -hmm. to make that project work. We're baking all of that in and we believe believe that we don't have all the answers yet, but we believe we're building the team and the expertise that we need to deliver those other impact components that go beyond just the financial returns. We also believe that it's not just going to be water equity as the investor that's going to come into the sector and provide those returns. But again, we want to like use our approach to kind of illuminate the path to help the capital markets understand that, yes, there is a way to put the these different pieces together in a way that allows you as an investor to come in and meet your investment criteria and get the impact that you want. So hopefully by illustrating, you know, we're not even to a half a billion dollars of of capital committed yet, but hopefully we'll get up into the billions. And then that should be enough of a signal effect, we hope, for other investors to come in through their own activities around the world. That's the, the vision. So you're crossing the chasm so that once it's then in the main market, people will realize that it's actually a suitable path and they will take the ball and keep it rolling. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we're seeing all types of investors come in for those 
returns, financial returns, and more. The fourth fund that we did, we had Starbucks invest in that fund. We had Ecolab. We had Reckitt. We had Caterpillar, Dow. These Fortune 100 companies that are now not using charity, (laughs) they're using their balance sheets to come into the funds. Why are they doing that, right? One is because they can get a financial return. Two is that this has potential to help with their ESG score. So many of them are focused on having a positive water footprint, water uh, resilience in their operations. And so they just see this as a way for them to learn more about water, have impact in water, ESG, and other areas like replenishment that they have as their corporate goals. It's trying to understand, you know, what are all of the the needs in the marketplace when capital comes in? Because it's not just a black and white, we need X percent of financial return. We don't care about anything else. It's like, we have a bar that we can't go below with our financial return, but we'll invest if we can get all these other attributes as well that are of value to us and our customers. It's numbers, it's statistics, it's theory, but today Mm -hmm. more than 50% of investors have Mm -hmm. impact as part Mm -hmm. of the investment thesis. So I think you... (laughs) <laughs> would check all the boxes for mm-hmm. impact. Mm-hmm. You mentioned financial returns, and I don't want to say something stupid because those numbers matter, but if mm-hmm. I'm right for your fifth fund, you're mm-hmm. aiming at 9% return. Is that mm-hmm. about right? I can't speak to the actual returns and numbers, but we are aiming for competitive financial returns, having a risk-reward profile that is appropriate. Which leads me to something I've noted myself whenever mm-hmm. I'm covering these kind of topics. Mm-hmm. I had the Rural Water Network on that microphone discussing what they do. Mm. I had project developers discussing what Mm. they do and I'm publishing this podcast on different platforms and different platforms have different audiences Mm. and different demographics. Mm. And that is on that specific topic, it shows. Because whenever I push that on LinkedIn, Mm. the podcast platforms, I get super positive returns. Like, that's great. It's good that those people show that there is a path where it is just sufficiently profitable that it's sustainable and so it's creating a snowball effect. You publish that exact same piece of content on TikTok, YouTube, <laughs> Instagram, wherever else. Like, oh my God, and what's next? Will we have to pay for children toys? They will put a tax on children toys and maybe I have to pay for the air I'm breathing. And oh, it's again those big corporates which try mm. to privatize water because people have seen Netflix rotten yes. and so they mm. see Nestle and, and the likes and they, they mm. do an association. So there is one element which is educating mm. the professionals and the financial markets Mm -hmm. There's another element which is educating Mm -hmm. the public. Is it also one part where you're looking at or you say, Mm -hmm. as long as the financial people Mm -hmm. get it, good for us? There's a lot of wrong ways to solve a problem like this. And we've seen those with privatization, not only privatization of the water infrastructure, but privatization of the water resource as well. And certainly that is something that we would never espouse to do. And it was very wrongheaded. Yet we also know that there isn't enough capital going into the system right now and that we can't just wait and make water free for everyone because it's it's a precious resource. It needs to have a price so that it will be conserved. The challenge is making sure that people who are in abject poverty, and we recognize that our approach, water credit and water equity, isn't going to be the complete solution because there are people who are so poor and so rural that they are not going to be able to get this through a loan. But the the point is, let's not treat everybody in the world who doesn't have access to water as equally poor. Let's segment the market and help those who all they need is a loan to get access, help them get that. And then what it can do is it can free up tremendous amount of resources from governments and other capital providers to say, look, this part of the market, we can do this with investment. This smaller part of the market of absolute poverty, we now have the resources that we're saving that we can apply that to people who are there. You need to have tariffs that are equitable. So in some countries, you have the first amount of water that's used each month, a few cubic meters free. And that's great. But then if you're using more cubic meters because, you know, you're not conserving or you're running a business with that extra water, you see, you know, people doing car washes, even in some low-income countries. It's like, well, yeah, if they're using that amount of water to go start a business, they should pay more per cubic meter. So there are ways to construct the whole ecosystem in a way that brings in the capital that's needed, but also helps ensure that the the poorest among us get the subsidy that they need. You mentioned the role of government. I'm regularly told that I'm the one 
was wrong because mm -hmm. I had super high expectations from the water conference at the UN last year. I mean, first since Mar del Plata 1977, mm -hmm. once in a lifetime almost. It's going to be a big event, everything. Mm -hmm. The conference starts and actually the pre-conference was incredibly good because the first thing they proposed was an interview of you and Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, so I was like, oh, oh they, they get it. It's the mm -hmm. right people. It's going to be, it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And then they do like an opening ceremony. And then from there on, it was not only downhill because mm -hmm. downhill would mean the beginning would be pretty good and then it goes downhill. No, really, it went to the bottom mm. and it stayed at the bottom for the entire mm. three days of the conference. Mm. I personally went out of that thinking, mm -hmm. forget it, mm. neither the UN mm. nor simply the countries will be able to solve that. Mm. The solution has to be somewhere else. And you say very, very rightfully that the solution can be somewhere else to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but there is still a section of the problem which is to be solved by the nations. Mm -hmm. Do you see a behind the scenes which would be more positive than what I experienced watching life from home, mm. which would bring back some hope in these international organizations to solve the problem. I do, but it's not huge. It's a spark of hope rather than like a flame, <laughs> I think, right now. There is no one who doesn't want to solve this problem. There are people who devote their lives to it in government, in these, these multilateral organizations, but you do tend to see kind of a calcification of approaches to solve the problem. And you you don't see a tremendous amount of innovation coming out of those those institutions. It's a government worker can like go on their whole career just kind of doing what they're doing as opposed to like sparking an innovation. And that's the safe path for them. The system is kind of built to not move very far one way or the other. And that's where I think you need to have the private sector. You need to have innovators kind of coming in to kind of jolt the system in a way and develop the evidence base and develop the proof that this is a new way of doing it. Then they'll follow. I really believe, you know, institutions like the UN and the World Bank, they're paying a lot of attention to what we're doing in terms of mobilizing capital markets for this. And they're getting on board. They're putting it on their platforms. The World Economic Forum was featuring a a lot of what we're doing. We had a pretty prominent place at the UN Water Conference. I just came from the World Water Forum in Bali, and I was on more panels giving more talks there than ever before because people do see this and are looking at it. And how does it incorporate with what they're trying to do with blended finance and, and other platforms that they're creating? You know, the glass is more half full than half empty, I think, but it isn't easy. If I try to bring that in my words, that's somewhat like those institutions are by S and by definition, mm. kind of laggards. And mm. I mean that with yeah. no negativity just because mm -hmm. it's the way they're built. Mm. So you have to be the one to ignite and to create the movement. But eventually, if you mm. bring it past the tipping point, yeah. they will take it from there. Yeah, you talked about crossing the chasm earlier. I imagine you read that book. You know, the early adopters, uh, the early majority, and then the late majority, and then laggards, right? Yeah, so I think I got that right. It's been a while since I read the book. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we want to position ourselves kind of in that innovation space and show that, yes, you can cross that chasm where most of the efforts just kind of fall into the chasm and you got to get over to those kind of late adopters, especially. That's where I hope we have our sights set because, it, again, it's, it's not us that's going to solve this problem. It's got to be us hypothesizing new ideas and building an evidence base that's undeniable so that the capital markets will come in. And I think it is interesting to see. I mean, we don't have, you know, we don't have the UN. We don't have governments like investing in our funds. Who's investing in our funds? It's high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. It's foundations like the Skoll Foundation and the Hilton Foundation. Foundations can take a little bit more risk. And then we have corporates. And the Fund 4, you know, that was $25 million from Starbucks. They invested. What we're seeing is real money coming in to this from the private sector. And what we hear from the World Bank is like, hey, you know, we would love to work with you more on this because we're trying to leverage the private sector to come into this. I was just told by a former World Bank staffer that the World Bank is right now only mobilizing about 40 cents for every $1 that they bring, 40 cents of private sector capital. And so I do think they are looking at us. We're talking to them. It's like, how can we work with you to 
one, help you fulfill your mandate more of like not just investing in infrastructure agnostically, but investing in it in a way to ensure that the last five or 10% of the population get connected, which is very important to them and a challenge for them, but then also a way that brings in the private capital markets to blend with the work that they're doing. And that's what we certainly see with, with water equity. I'd love it to see you know us doing that project development and providing 10% of the infrastructure cost and then see the bank come up with the rest or put it together f- to the local investors in those markets. That's what we want to be able to capitalize. Kind of blended capital. Exactly. And, yeah. I have one last question on, on the other side of, of that that scope, because mm-hmm. we've talked about your way in the middle. We've talked mm-hmm. about how institutions will eventually get the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. But what happens to traditional charity? Does mm-hmm. it still exist mm-hmm. in the future? And let me take an anecdote example to just illustrate that because you're pretty familiar with mm. some star power given your co-founder for a different generation the number one star in the world today is probably mr beast mm-hmm. he's the yeah. largest youtuber mm. on the platform must have something like 260 million subscribers mm. and last year it got very well publicized but already two years before he did mm. the same so he did mm. twice to to drill 100 wells i think yeah. the first time he drilled yeah. 30 wells and the second time he drilled 100 wells the reaction to that was a mixed bag on one end mm. people say, hey, before they had nothing, after they had something. But mm-hmm. you also have to acknowledge that there are about 300,000 abandoned pumps in Africa. Mm-hmm. So again, I'm going to steal your word. You're saying it's the difference between doing it for them mm-hmm. and doing it with them. Mm-hmm. Will that still exist in the future? Or does that have to be somewhat replaced mm-hmm. for the better with your kind of approaches? Mm-hmm. I think it, it does have to be replaced with better approaches. Any water NGO that's out there operating this space, and there's probably more than a thousand of water NGOs that are out there doing that type of kind of what we call direct impact projects. And I think that the ones that have been doing it for a while, they're always looking to find ways to ensure sustainability and having different mechanisms built in. And sometimes that works, but frankly, still, it doesn't most of the time. If you kind of go back and look at projects five or five or 10 years later, there needs to be kind of an increase. Those organizations always need to be thinking about how can they do that better to get things more sustainable. And a lot of organizations are. But I think we also just need to rethink how philanthropy works. What we tend to see in this space is that everybody who lacks access to water is in need of charity. And so that's kind of the the thesis that we have started from. And that's the thesis that I started from, you know, back in 1990, that that was what had to be done. But if you look at how the nature of poverty has evolved and changed, you look at, you know, I love this book by Hans Rosling, Factfulness. Mm-hmm. And just talking about how people perceive how the world is doing with respect to poverty, how we perceive it is it continues to get worse. If you look at the numbers, you know, Bill Gates talks about this a lot, too. If you look at the numbers of what's happened, billions of people have lifted themselves out of poverty. We're still stuck in the water sector as thinking about how it used to be decades ago, when really now there are billions of people who could participate, who've lifted themselves out of poverty. And when you come out of poverty, what's one of the first things you want? You want water. (laughs) You don't want to be spending all your money and all your time to get water. So like, this is why people are taking these loans out. You know, they get to a certain level of poverty and it's like, now I can take out that loan because it's going to add all this value for me. So I do think we need to kind of help catch up our charity mindset with the market that we're trying to serve. What we basically said, we stopped doing direct impact work quite a while ago, not because we didn't think it was still good. But if the other thousand NGOs are doing a charity-led approach, there's probably room for one to focus just Mm -hmm. on a market-based approach. And that's why I think I've been doing this for a long time. And I've often said the things that determine our success are much more what we've said no to than what we've said yes to. And you have to be very disciplined, especially when you're a smaller startup. You have to say no a lot. You have to understand where your sweet spot is, where what you're doing is unique in the marketplace. And then you have to say no to a lot of other things. I see all kinds of entrepreneurs, you know, like I said, I was just in Bali. I was at the World Water Conference. I get all kinds of people pitching me 
you know, at water.org. In fact, at the water conference, one gentleman followed me into the bathroom (laughs) while I was at the urinal and was pitching me the whole time. It's a crazy kind of thing. I think that's amazing that people have such passion for this, but uh, we have had to say no to so many things. And that's why, you know, we now have the success we've had on water credit, why water equity is stood up and running and why we are able to launch Water Connect. Those are things that are unique in this space. And we've chosen to put our resources there. Now, that doesn't mean that the whole ecosystem needs to have different players. It's just that that's kind of where we focused. You mentioned the passion. You mm-hmm. mentioned how you started in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I wish you a prosperous life (laughs) but within the book and repeatedly you're saying that you want to solve that Mm. in this lifetime what is your level of confidence that this will happen hi hi because what we see is that there is this underlying market this underlying demand this underlying willingness to pay for these services and we see you know women taking up solutions on their own to solve their own problems. We definitely know that water creates immense value for people. It's clear. People coming out of poverty are willing and able to pay for that at a fairly low level of service, and then eventually they can elevate that. What we also know is that we have created the financial plumbing that can connect those women to the capital markets. The capital markets have different risk return profiles, as we've talked about. Sometimes they build in more ESG in terms of what they see as the return. But by and large, We've gone from a system, when I started in this business, where every dollar that went into water and sanitation through philanthropy went in and was spent and was gone. Now we're seeing us able to bring philanthropy in and cycle it over and over again. At first, that was just break even, but then it evolved to like actually being able to provide financial returns. So if you look at that journey, if you look at that value that's created by water for people, if you look at that philanthropy getting multiplied over and over again, if you look at having the financial network in place that can find those projects to invest in and have a connection to the capital markets, and you know the capital markets are theoretically infinite, right? There's just so much inertia in all the machinery that's in there. It's calcified, it's stuck, it's rusty, it moves at a slow pace. But that's how capitalism works. If you create value for somebody and you have capital, they're going to find each other. And what we're trying to do is to kind of oil the machine, to take the friction out a little bit. Once you jolt that all into place and let the system kind of sort itself out, then yes, I do have confidence that that's going to happen in an accelerating rate. And hopefully I'll live a long life to see it. That's a perfect conclusion for this deep dive. And I think it's absolutely logical with what you said, which is the inertia first goes against you, but Mm. once Mm. it started, goes with you because then it keeps pushing. To round off those interviews, I have a set of rapid fire questions where I have to cheat and look at my notes okay? because I made them special for this event. Uh, Well, I don't have notes, so we'll see how I do. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is your definition of innovation in action? Innovation in action is observing and having a hypothesis about what's wrong and then, you know, creating a solution and iterating. What is the most innovative water solution you've seen in the past 12 months? <laughs> Uh, the innovation is at the household level and it's like saying we can't be dependent on just one water source. These are people who were like saying, okay, we need the well. We also know that that could go dry. And so we need to figure out, you know, is there a different way, a different loan that we can take out to make the well deeper or to get a pump? And so to me, it's that the innovation of knowing you don't put all your eggs in one basket when you're a poor person living without water and you have to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And to me, that's incredibly smart and innovative because if you don't have have different levels of plan, you don't have water and you're stuck. In one word, (laughs) what is the biggest challenge facing the water industry today? Finance. I would have expected that one. (laughs) Who is a water innovator you admire and why? You know, I would say somebody who didn't know they were a water innovator, but that I admire, but they turned out to be a water innovator is Muhammad Yunus, right? Because he built 
the the system of microfinance. And so we're standing on his shoulders. And I think his insight into microfinance is a pretty strong reason why we've reached so many people. Did you work one-to-one with him? No, I didn't. I didn't. You know, I've, I've met him on a couple of occasions and we've had, we've had exchange of ideas about this. What's one single piece of advice you would give to emerging water entrepreneurs? I think study the problem. I, I started going to TED years ago in some of the early days. And the reason I went wasn't to hang out with a bunch of other water people. It was to hang out with people who had completely different businesses and ways of approaching things and getting that cross-fertilization of ideas. So to me, the best piece of advice for entrepreneurs is to get outside of your domain and figure out what are those, because you can try and kind of put the square peg in the round hole for a long time. But once you get outside of your domain, you might find a different shape peg. And then it all becomes so much easier. And for us, that was like understanding how do you take the problem that you're solving and you apply something that seemed unrelated, which is microfinance, and plug that round peg into the round hole, and then boom. What's the common misconception about water innovation that you'd like to debunk? Ah, I think we talked about it a lot, that, that all people who lack access to water are too poor to pursue their own solution. It's not the first time I hear Paul giving those figures about the mm-hmm. economy which is unlocked if you give mm-hmm. access to people to water, but I think it's a kind of refresh pressure that but yeah it's if i open that door we're still here in in one hour so (laughs) Mm -hmm. what is one water taboo that you broke or you believe we should break i keep coming back to the same thing and that that the the taboo was that you could you know people are willing to pay for water and that they should pay for water and they do that because what they pay is only a small fraction of the value it creates for them and the last one which Mm -hmm. is the traditional one what can and should i do for you what you should do is get this podcast out to as many people (laughs) as possible so i'm sure you're on that uh Uh, But no, I think storytelling, you know, this is an incredible interview, by the way, you've you've done a great job, that storytelling of the issue and breaking it down for people so that they understand. Again, I have a great team at water.org and Water Equity and Water Connect, and we try to emphasize, you know, storytelling as much as the, you know, the financial machinations of this. And so I think having more people kind of tell the story and breaking it down and and drawing it out from us, I think, is an important thing to, to do. So I appreciate that. And there's lots that everybody can do. You know, again, we need philanthropic capital. We need investment capital. Credited investors should feel free to reach out to us if they want to join in. As there's a lot that people can do, where can Mm. they follow up with you the best? Mm. Just water.org and waterequity.com. Two good places to start. You made a super clever move to have your website clear to everybody. Everybody (laughs) knows where to find you. So, (laughs) Yes. Gary, it's been an, I mean, pleasure for sure, but an honor to Mm. have you. I'm super happy that Mm. uh, it it happened because since I read your book, Mm. I've dreamed of that moment. So I'm Mm. super happy to to have had that conversation with you. I hope it's not the last one, (laughs) but I'll let you enjoy the rest of the Blue Tech Forum. And I hope to see you soon in the future. Thank you, Antoine. Nice job. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.